Um, so my name is Elada Evangelou. Um, I'm very happy to be here and it's the timing could not have been more perfect um, for, for this conference to take place. Completely selfishly speaking, I'm very much looking forward to this um, learning and exchange opportunity. Um, and the, the, this entire idea and the practice, the conscious practice of how arts relates with care is something that I think unconsciously uh, we've been dealing with and we've really been trying to um, have at the forefront of our activities uh, in the work that we do in Nicosia. Um, and it will make sense how um, in a little bit. So just kind of to say which hat I'm wearing today, um, I'm gonna to speak about my experience um, as the um, artistic director of a festival called the Buffer Fringe Performing Arts Festival. Um, and this is um, a position that I held in uh, 2019, 2020, and 2021. And in 2022, I was part of the creative team of the festival, but we worked with a group of curators um, as the, as in relation to the more curatorial um, approach. So um, the title of this, um, of this presentation is Exploring Care in Festivals in Contested Spaces. So that's also something I'm going to talk about. So what makes um, the buffer zone of Nicosia where uh, the festival was presented um, on and off during that time, during these years, um, what makes it contested and how is it that we can, uh, we can approach our practice there in a way that is conscious of care. And as I said, this process has been um, subconscious up to now. Um, we framed it more in terms of solidarity towards artists because if you remember, 2020 and 2021 were pandemic years. So there was a huge crisis amongst arts practitioners um, and even more so on a small island cut off uh, really early on um, the two sides of the island were cut off very early on and then the airports and obviously ports. So these types of discussions are discussions that we've had in our creative realm um, in how is it that we as, as um, organizations and as individuals that make space for um, arts practitioners, uh, how do we stand in solidarity practically with artists? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And then I'm gonna finish it off with um, a project that I'm part of um, that I wanted to uh, let you know about. Um, and yes, and it's, it's also one of the main reasons for, my, um, my, for this need for me to educate myself about global practices. Um, at the moment, we're talking about mostly practices in, in the Euro-Mediterranean region, but um, I think that there's a big movement, especially after the, after the pandemic era, to think about this more of as a global concern. So, um, planning and implementing a festival. Uh, so in 2019, when I started off trying to see how it was that I would go from my academic project-based uh, life to running a festival, um, basically there were two, um, I would say that, that there was a, there, the concerns, my concerns had to do mostly with how I would deal with space. So in 2019, I, what I wanted to really uh, deal with was kind of the first, this first part of how is it that we can support artistic and ethical integrity and perform and regenerate um, the area of the buffer zone. So the Buffer Fringe Performing Arts Festival comes from the Home for Cooperation. Uh, I'll show you the area a little bit. It's, it's a producing organization. It's an annual festival that started in 2014. Um, and basically, yeah, its first concern is to make space for festivals and intercommunal creation. So in planning and implementing a festival, the, this very first concern was the artistic and ethical integrity of that. So, and to break it down a little bit more, how is it that we bring together peace building as a social and activist practice that happens in Cyprus and it's been happening for many decades now, um, since the war and the separation. And it was, um, it really kind of took a very um, substantial life after the opening of the checkpoints. So how is it that we do that in, in the buffer zone? Um, 
And so peace building and the arts to think about that and placing them in this, in this space of the Lidra Palace uh, checkpoint. And then the second, and this is the discussion that I also want to have a little bit more today, is how, do, how does that relate to the well-being of artists and the creative team? Um, the creative team uh, is one that has basically developed over the years. Um, and by 2022, it has become quite a tight group. Um, so both the artists that come in annually, some collaborations continue, but also the creative team that that is a stable force, um, how does that um, uh, manifest itself? So um, this is a picture of 2014. This is a picture from the very first um, Barford Fringe Festival. And I'm the person in the forefront with the camera. That, I mean, I did the absolute worst job of capturing the performance. Uh, it's really not my thing. But in 2014, um, this space opened in the buffer zone. The first Buffer Fringe Performing Arts Festival took place in the Lidra Palace Buffer Zone, which is the space between the two communities. Um, and it brought, it brought together um, uh, quite a few, I would say, well, there, it, it was, I would say, quite a rupture at the time because um, hundreds of people did come together for the first time from the two sides to observe to art, to, to witness art together. At the time, the festival was not international. It was only local. Uh, but before we kind of go on and talk about the artistic side, I'd like to talk about the, 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 the social setting um, for um, just, just so that we're all on the same page. So what makes this space contested? So the first reason is identity. So identity in Cyprus is, um, it, it is a dis the discussion around identity in Cyprus has been very, um, uh, polarized um, in the last 120, 130 years since the generation of nationalism in the two main communities on the island. At the same time, um, in parallel to Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots manifesting their um, outward looking nationalism towards Greece and Turkey, um, other communities on the island also created, tried to make their own space, uh, but with, with a lot of ups and downs. So, Armenians and Armenian Cypriots went through um, having a mostly commercial relationship with the island to um, becoming refugees that fled from the genocide. Um, Maronite Cypriots um, although had a very stable presence on the island um, at, during the years also go through a lot of ups and downs relating to their um, identity affiliations with Lebanon. Um, the migrant community on the island, both in the north and in the south of the island, fluctuates and changes greatly uh, depending on the financial conditions in the area. And that includes Turkey, that includes uh, Syria, um, uh, areas in the eastern Mediterranean and North Africa where, where great um, where waves of migration um, come in and out of the island. So identity is one not, um, it does not limit itself to the two, it, it, to the two um, kind of um, the black and white, the Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriot, there is a lot of discussion that is being had relating to different communities that live on the island, um, but much of it is not really acknowledged, and it's definitely not acknowledged by the by the arts by the hegemonic artistic narrative. So the hegemonic artistic narrative, to a great extent, limits itself to a mostly Greco-Christian orientation in the Republic of Cyprus and a mostly um, Turkish, um, um, Turkish Ottoman orientation to, in, the, in the Turkish Cypriot community. And then it's as if other communities on the island don't exist. Uh, there's a really big hole, a really big gap when it comes to the one-fifth of the population at the moment that are not Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. Even more, I would say, in the north. So identity is a discussion that is um, that kind of exists on two levels: the official level, um, whereby there's kind of the two, the two stable uh, uh, pillars, and then the actual artistic, uh, the actual social and artistic movement, which is a lot more fluid. This picture is from 1954, uh, and it's from a demonstrations in the streets of London. Uh, by Greeks and Cypriots, um, and it says Enosis, which is basically debates, um, uh, advocates for, for the union of Cyprus with Greece. 
So it's a, um, discussions that take um, the, um, our ideological and identity orientation to this extreme doesn't, don't really leave much room for more social discussion. Um, and I'm, I haven't even touched on the issue of language, and we're not going to do that because it's very, very long and, and quite problematic. So um, I'd like to stand, though, in a date that's very important, and the 20th anniversary of it is coming up, which is shocking. So in, uh, in April 2003, uh, the first checkpoint opened, and this is a picture of the perfect law and order that <laughs> prevailed in Lidra Palace when people were trying to understand, you know, what happens? Do I cross? Do I not cross? Can I go? If I cross, do I come back? Am I going to get arrested? Despite of this kind of chaos and panic, when the checkpoints opened in 2003, thousands of people basically uh, crossed from north to south and south to north. Turkey Cypriots came to the south and Greek Cypriots went to the north. Um, and this continued for several weeks. What this did was basically made the Lidra Palace buffer zone um, into from a place where um, that was closed since 1974, that housed a huge UN barracks, that was basically a, a place where only diplomats and people with that new people could cross. Uh, it became a place where everybody could cross, um, became a, a place of passage. Um, and it was kind of during that time when this kind of overall NGO regeneration started. Um, and there was also a lot of money pumped into civil society, which didn't really exist. It, it was kind of becoming born at the time. So Cypriot civil society did receive a lot of guidance from, from a lot of um, international agencies. Um, the UN, also the EU started to, be, to get into the game because we were kind of in a process of, of becoming a member. Um, the Swedes and the Norwegians and a lot of very, very well-meaning international organizations started to help to, reject, to, to create a civil society. So part of the civil society started to advocate for spaces where uh, communities could meet. So an, uh, an association called the Association for Historical Dialogue and Research advocated for a place to meet in the buffer zone. Uh, and just kind of so that you can get an idea of what we're talking about. So this is a picture of the whole of Nicosia. You can kind of see the, the Venetian walls. And this is the area that we're talking about. This is the actual um, space of the buffer zone. The Lidra Palace Hotel is this barracks uh, that I talked about of the UN. And the, this association that was advocating for a place where Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots would meet um, actually did the impossible. It managed to receive funding and political support, at least political kind of, you know, turning, a, turning an, an eye to what was happening type of, of policy. Um, so they purchased the Home for Cooperation, um, and, which was a kind of a wreck um, at the time, and they built this lovely place, which is a community space. Uh, it was inaugurated in 2011, um, and it became a meeting place uh, for, for, um, for individuals and groups. Um, and as part of the peace building activities, um, they, there were, so the, funded mostly by the EA grants, the Norwegian grants. Uh, as part of the peace building activities was also um, artistic events about that. So the Home for Cooperation in 2013 um, received a lot of applications for theater um, projects, theater events. Um, and I was, I was a member of the board at the time, so I was kind of, I was very excited and very happy about this. So the discussion started, how about we do a festival? So how about we do a fringe festival so people can kind of feel f free to experiment? Uh, what can we call it? Let's call it the Buffer Fringe Performing Arts Festival. Brilliant. So voila, the, the festival was born in 2014. As I said, the first festival was only um, intercommunal, was only um, uh, involved people from, from the north and the south of the island. Um, and yeah, it's, this festival started to generate two very important things. Um, the new spectator and collective authorship. So the new spectator was no longer 
um, a predictable entity. The, the new spectator is a spectator that could come from Turkey speaking, the Greek speaking, or other communities of the island. Um, the fact that you did have this group of people and you didn't know who was standing next to you watching Marilena be a very, uh, <laughs> a very excited tour guide of the buffer zone. Um, so you, the fact that you didn't know who was standing next to you and you didn't know how you collectively related to the spectacle was in itself, I would say, almost groundbreaking. Um, so the, the new, the new um, spectatorship that started to be built in the buffer zone was something that was quite new. Um, and just kind of to, to add, it's also fascinating the fact that this has continued for nine years. Um, also through, um, through the pandemic. Um, the other very important fact is that um, through um, collaborative projects um, and also through interactive performances, we also have this idea of collective authorship. So how is it that we co-author um, the new works that are generated out of this space? And it's important to, to kind of always be um, to always remember that it's the, it's the space that creates these conditions in this, in this case. So the Buffer Fringe Festival it, it's a, has also been presented in spaces in South Nicosia and spaces in North Nicosia. It's also been a promenade through the city. I, my personal kind of perspective is when it's taken out of this um, kind of geographical context, um, these balances change. I think the, the new spectatorship and the collective author authorship that is born there is unique. Um, and it's unique because of how, almost through this process of, of a kind of a random composition um, of the audience members, this has a dynamic uh, that is more democratic than if you present in the South or if you present in the North. So this is something that we've kind of seen. If we have a venue in North Nicosia, we have a venue in South Nicosia, most people would come from the community where the art, where the art is presented, right? The buffer zone is a, pr a place where there's there's been, I would say, a, a democratization of spectatorship. Right? Um, and so this is a picture from a performance called Bam uh, by a, a play called Yorgos Neofitu. This is in the moat. And this was in uh, 2015, 2016. It was a time when there was there were talks and there was a lot of excitement about a potential solution. Um, so making the work happen and putting, a, a, putting a, um, an artistic manifestation in the buffer zone is something that it requires quite a bit of work. So I see Claire and Obisti here, and they, I think they can, also, <laughs> they can also be kind of offer testimony to the fact that it takes a lot of work to make it happen. So um, Claire Bishop in Artificial Health uh, talks about a process as a result. Um, it does take negotiating, it takes a lot, whole lot of planning, uh, it takes a lot of kind of diplomatic um, uh, processes to, um, to be able to produce the art as it was imagined in this specific space. So to set up a stage, to bring in a fake tree, um, and to have gunshots in a performance, or in another performance, we set a house on, fi house on fire, like through projections. Like all these things need to, to, to be negotiated, right? But it's the process of putting this forth um, is so meaningful and for so many people and really does kind of create this process of, of, um, of kind of collaborative, um, I don't know, like it's, it's a new type of creativity. And I think the fact that I've done the festival for four years is the fact that I'm, I was a little bit fixed on that, right? It, it, really, was my, it really was my fix. How far can I go? Um, so it's, it's a fascinating thing putting it together. Um, yeah, it's not just a romantic side. It's how can I negotiate with the Greek Cypriot police, the Turkish Cypriot police, the Turkish army, and the UN to make this happen, right? Another very important element, I think, in how this, this space behaves is that certain porosity can come through performativity. So this is from the very first, <laughs> this is from the very first um, uh, Buffer Fringe, and it's from a play called Shift that Rooftop Theater, which is also an NGO that I'm part of, had done. And we put, we put up this, uh, put, we put up this um, kind of game show, 
it was completely kind of taking it to the to the end you know there's you know red dresses and feathers and stuff like that but what this game show asked the audience was which of the following would be the best way to pass the buffer zone with your pet dog so this is one of those big ridiculous things that exist in the green line regulations that you can actually not pass through the, the buffer zone with your pet so this this became part of a game show but for me this is kind of the it, it's just one of those things that within that space you make you you make fun of the space it's a very kind of a sarcastic approach so performance does is one of those tools that kind of put holes in in whatever wall there is a mental wall and a physical wall um, okay and also I wanted to offer two three examples of um, um, of this kind of new performativity of how contestedness can exist in, in different spaces. And one of them is mentioned, and I'm stealing this from, from Claire Bishop, so it's uh, Oda Projesi, which is a, it was a, I would say, kind of a groundbreaking project that was done in Istanbul in the early 2000s, whereby these neighborhoods that um, had, um, 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 that, that were begin, beginning to become so poor because of, of gentrification that they couldn't really sustain uh, systems of, of self-organization, um, artists would go in and they would, they would organize them around what the community had. So these were um, projects that, that went on for, for quite a few years, whereby artists would um, get to know the community, they would work with them in, during a length of time to create these sustainable artistic um, community organizing structures. So this is one. The second one is the, this, this production of BAM. Um, and BAM was about a, a, a whatever, a Greek speaker and a Turkish speak, speaker that um, they f happened to f um, fall in a, a landmine type of thing. There's an explosion and they both go deaf. So it's, it's a comedy. Uh, and there's a lot of kind of this sharing of, you know, um, common words in Greek and Turkish and the dialect and there's a lot of that game but what I find also to be um, uh, to be a very interesting um, kind of contribution to this discussion is that this was also a mainstream play that was supported by the UN to kind of find its position in in the buffer zone yes and yes it was in a time of euphoria when the talks were going really well but still the fact that mainstream though you know a little bit subversive type of performance made it here was also quite interesting and the last one is is i mean it is a project that's very close to my heart it's a collaboration of rooftop with gulgun kayim uh, gulgun was a is a um a director um based in in minneapolis and we worked together to through device processes to to put this this project in the buffer zone uh, through a promenade performance. So for me, these types of kind of very fluid, very um, even kind of transnational type of efforts are very, very meaningful in this conversation. So I'm getting to a, a point. Um, so we've been thinking a lot about what, what elements, um, uh, what elements does artistic and ethical um, integrity consist of? And I'm, I have a, a, a great love for uh, Franz Fanon, um, an um, Algerian post-colonial scholar and, and um, a medical doctor who wrote about the colonial experience um, between the Mediterranean South and the Mediterranean North. We'll just kind of put it as, as, simply as, as simple as that. Um, and in his book, Black Skin, White, White Masks, he said, oh my body, make me always a man, woman who questions. So for me, that's kind of the, the basis of how it is that we can maintain integrity, and it's through a constant process of questioning. Um, if we start to take things, and this is, this is very uncypriot, by the way. Um, so <laughs> uh, it's a bit of a paradigm shift to, to question things that appear to be very comfortable. And this is the, the discussion around the buffer zone has become comfortable for a lot of peace builders, for a lot of NGO workers, for a lot of academics. Um, and this has implications, that has, this has more severe implications when it comes to places like Varosha, where the space, the, place, the space of Varosha also came to be a comfortable, frozen, abandoned city. 
and suddenly it wasn't, right? So uh, if, if we, we start to think about space and our relationship with space as something that is a stable value, uh, and that something that has stable parameters, then it would be very, very difficult for us to continue and to question um, our relationship with that space. And then how it, is, and how it is that we as artists place ourselves in that space. So this type of fluidity, this kind of process of, of questioning is for me the basis of how it is that we should, uh, we should deal with them. Um, we should always remember the embodied experience of, of, um, of negotiating with these spaces. And this is something that we see when, okay, some of us uh, kind of as academics or people that we, we engage with students when we bring in the, the body of a 19 or 20 year old into the buffer zone, the, the, that experience, that embodied experience of shock is not something, it's something that we take for granted because it's happened, it happened so many times, um, but it's still there and it's very intense on a personal level. So the embodied experience of being present and then being, uh, manifesting artwork in this space is something that should be a stable value. So, the, BC, the big C word, so the colonizer colonized type of, a, of our relationship. Um, I wanna bring up a point in relation to the buffer zone um, that is very specific to this zone, and I kind of mentioned it just fleetingly a little, uh, a little while ago. So, the type of colonization that exists, that has existed in the buffer zone for the past 20 years is a process to a great extent of the division, right? And it's the fact that you have four army slash protection services all around. So in many ways, the way that we are seen is a new type of colonization. And I can't, maybe I, I should be using the word a little bit more cautiously, but the, the fact that there is a specific onlook of all of these agents, so the Greek Cypriot police, the Turkish Cypriot police, the Turkish army and the UN, the way that we are seen through those eyes, I find it to be very colonizing. At times, that also includes some of the funders. So at times there's also funders that, uh, that um, adopt this colonial gaze upon the, the artwork the, uh, that happens in this zone. And yes, that's also a process that needs to be questioned, right? So to remember that if, if artistically I, I would, if artistically I need to make specific statements, um, the negotiation with these people that are around my space, again, needs to be constantly questioned. That's why the questioning is so very important. And these are also, there are a lot of very, very well-meaning people, very well-meaning people. So peace building is, that's kind of, it's a, it can be a very big trap, right? Um, but what I, what I think that we should kind of keep in mind is that this needs to be a discussions-based relationship, right? Um, obviously, there is a big element of class and classism that happens in kind of artistic work. Um, we found it increasingly difficult to create the space inclusive for migrants. We've had some examples, but just kind of a very ironic, just, just the irony blew my mind. So in 2021, it was kind of, you know, kind of the COVID was just in its kind of final stages. And there were, there was a three young um, refugees, uh, migrants from uh, Ghana that were trapped in the buffer zone. So they came in, the Greek Cypriot police said, uh-uh, you can't go. And they were there for five months living in, living in tents at the back of the Home for Cooperation. At the same time, we were organizing an arts festival. And we were saying, yes, of course, we're open to other voices, we're open to migrants. So, yes, we can ignore that, but it was a fact. So that, that space encompasses so many problematic balances and imbalances that it's just very important to be conscious of it, right? Um, so class and privilege and access, all of these things exist there in other types of quite hyped um, kind of experiential conditions. Okay, suppression and violence, yes. This is a discussion I'm a little bit over. Yes, the buffer zone of Lidra Palace was a space of violence, for sure. And it's, 
It has a very long legacy up to including the 1970s. Must be acknowledged for sure. Just I think that the generation of artists and citizens in their 20s and 30s, especially people kind of coming from abroad, that has either been kind of sidetracked or forgotten or completely romanticized. So it's a discussion, it's, a, it's a, an element that needs to be part of our discussion, but I, I would argue not central. It's a very gendered discussion. Uh, as a female organizer, I would say that, you know, you're looked upon in specific ways. Um, it's a very long conversation. And desire. So, um, so Franz Fanon speaks about this in absolutely beautiful ways. Um, so we can we can talk about this if if you want. Um, it's just it's quite a it's quite a large conversation to start. So it it is an element that that enters a space that it's so politicized, it's so exoticized, right? Um, and that it has all these um, kind of, yeah, desires become very contested within this space. All right, so um, two words about the well-being of artists and the creative team. So through the years we've collaborated, so going to the festival now, 2019 it was kind of a fully fledged um, festival in Nicosia South, Nicosia North, and in the buffer zone. Um, and that's when um, Toby Stinklevs' lab had participated um, with their own tent. Um, and then 2020 and 2021 were hybrid. Uh, and then 22 again was, was th these uh, Zoom pictures are from 22. Um, and these are pictures with our curators from Australia, Lebanon, and Cyprus. And Deria is in her car. <laughs> driving between Famagusta and Nicosia, and with our thinking partners in uh, Rotterdam. So the International Community Arts Festival of Rotterdam, we're our thinking partners, and I'll explain what that means in a little bit. Um, but we had um, regular communication in 2022 with our curators. We had uh, five of them, two individuals and one group. Um, constant communication with them, um, and with our thinking partners to make sure that we create a protected environment for artists that would come into uh, the space, but also for the curators that, uh, so that flew in from Australia and Lebanon to be here for a week for the, for the performance. Um, and it's something that took about six, six months of preparation and a lot of discussion. Um, to be able to bring everything together. So let me just share a few thoughts about um, what the, these margins of contestedness that are created because of our situation and where we are, and how it is that we work, how can we overcome them? So um, in the process of these four years, um, we, we talked about inclusion, right? And um, Inclusion is something that, again, because of how hegemonic narratives work in the two communities is not something that's a given. So um, inclusion relating to in, um, uh, Greek Cypriots, Turkish Cypriots, um, migrants, migrant, migrant Turks in the north of the island, uh, but also international, um, international artists, is something that was very important to us. And that is something that I believe manifests itself as care. Um, opening up the, our pool of artists to, um, and curators, but there's far fewer of them, to people that live on the island, that everybody internationally that aligns with our artistic mission is something that's very important. Inclusion as care for us is also language equity. So what we ask for our artists is to translate um, things in the language of the other community and or English as something that's, you know, uh, English is our lingua franca, whatever, we're over it. But when there are works that are in Greek or Turkish, we do ask that they're translated. And this is, I mean, it's ridiculous, but it's not a given, right? So it has meant a lot to a lot of people. And that's why I'm mentioning it here. Um, asking people, what do you need? So and this is from feedback that we got from artists. So we always thought that we were very inadequate because we never had enough money. Um, but 
artist told us it was very important for us that you asked us, what do you need kind of coming in? Um, and this was both for locals and for internationals. And this became, and I'm very, very, very happy to say this, this became a culture with the festival, right? To create a, an environment whereby what do you need was a question that went around. Um, and one of the ways with, with, it, with which we try to, to, um, to practice inclusion was the Thinking Partners Program. So the Thinking Partners Program was born in 2020, and it was the year where we all felt super vulnerable. It was the first year of the pandemic. We really didn't know what we were doing. Um, and we, but we decided to do the festival. We'll see how it goes, and we'll do the festival, right? Um, at the time, we were supported um, by um, an international um, collaborative, um, a project called Impact, and it's uh, a global platform for arts, culture, and conflict transformation. It's based out of Brandeis University in Boston. So these people said, in, in true Buffer Fringe style, what do you need? And we said, can we create collaborative um, can, um, dialogue maybe opportunities for artists? Can we make them feel that they are, that they are part of a, a thing when they're actually living in their living rooms, when they're just kind of, they can't go out and they, and we started thinking about this and okay, so what could this be? And we said, okay, let's ask them what artistic or, I don't know, friendly collaboration they wanna have. And we'll call these people that we bring in their thinking partners. Um, and so if one group needed a dramaturg, we'd find a dramaturg. If another group needed an environmental scientist, we'd find an environmental scientist. So we matched up our artists with thinking partners. These kind of happen all over the world. We created a small system whereby they needed to have at least two meetings. And then, you know, if chemistry worked, amazing. There's people that became friends and they worked together. There's other people that spoke twice and then never spoke again. All of these are fine. But the idea was, Everybody, what we really wanted is everybody to be included in this in a way that it would benefit them in a very kind of humane and a very grounded type of way, right? So Thinking Partners continued in 2021. Uh, Impact kept um, um, funding us. And then in 2022, what we said was, could we get a thinking partner? <laughs> so we um, made this collaboration with, uh, with, Rock, with ICAF, the International Community Arts uh, Festival, you saw before. And they, with their huge experience in community-based work, they became our curators, our uh, thinking partners. And how is it that we <laughs> talk with five different curators, one group based in Australia, one in Cyprus, two, two, one in Cyprus and one in, in Lebanon? So this, this thinking partner scheme really did serve um, to, to make um, this hierarchical structure, which we do have at the festival. Just kind of to be clear, artistic, artistic director, you know, a technical director, the, the, this type of pyramid does exist. But what we try to do is kind of to smooth a little bit the edges and create dialogue-based processes whereby we could support the larger group without micromanaging which is super important. Um, and how is it that you do that? So we're very grateful to Impact and our friends in, in Boston for, being, for creating the conditions for being able to pay for it, which is obviously a long, painful story. So visibility as support. Um, another thing that became increasingly important is how is it that we can, that we can support artists in things that Typically, they, we are not good at. And documentation became one of them. So in 2020, what we decided was that in parallel to the Thinking Partners program, we would create the conditions for people to upload their work, their work in progress onto um, our blog, bufferfringe.org, um, and to, to tell the public, again, locked in their living rooms, what it is that they were doing. At the same time, what they would get out of it was an archive of their own process. So if you do go um, on bufferfringe.org, you can find the, the work for 2020 and 2021. In 2021, it was less, I would say, less meaningful. People were, I think, had a, like a, a lower, like not, a, not a, such a big need to communicate their process. But still, it was, it was really cool to see it, you know? And there was an audience that was created around it. 
And there was maybe like another informal system of care of people that said, you know, when are you coming out with the next update on your work? It's, you know, it's, it's great. Uh, we also hosted global dialogue events uh, with, um, with global practitioners and academics um, from Impact, um, our artists, and then us as a team. And there was a lot of informal, can I say bitching, uh, on the um, online because we needed it. People needed to vent. So we created these, um, yeah, these opportunities whereby visibility on these online platforms guaranteed that people again had a chance to express themselves. And finally, partnerships. We are on an island. We also suffer from, from islandness, which is a sickness that makes you think that you are the center of the world. Um, so creating partnerships and understanding each other in other small communities uh, that also think the same, uh, is, it's very freeing. And it's, it was an absolute pleasure to be able to have um, our partners, for example, in Rotterdam, speaking with people um, in the US um, and like in, in other places where we, were, where we received support. Um, and we also we gave support, which was also wonderful. And I'm finishing with this. Why is this such a great um, kind of coincidence that I'm here? Because <laughs> um, I'm uh, just kind of quite recently, um, I'm part of um, kind of a, an international uh, consortium of, um, of academics and practitioners brought together by the NYU Theater and Health Lab who are putting together um, a resource for arts practice and the ethics of care with this title for the World Health Organization. So this is an, a, it's a wonderful kind of initiative that's being run by NYU, the university that I was, um, I was a, a, a fellow at last year. Um, and I wanted to basically make you aware of this and to say that um, if, if, um, if, we are, if you are okay with it, I would love to kind of reach out and see if there is interest um, for maybe a meeting around um, these types of practices in Cyprus um, because th this, this is, um, it's a resource that will also be based on, um, on case studies. So, let's take a step back. The, the aim of this is the development of a participatory action research process to engage arts practitioners in the generation of an initial resource. So this is the process that we're at now. Through a series of meetings, this is an international um, kind of consortium. Um, and there are two people from, from every um, area. I'm in the you know, easy peasy Middle East, North Africa region, uh, along with a, a colleague from Lebanon. Um, and the, the big challenge is, what have we talking about for the past 40 minutes? How can we translate this into case studies and make them part of a resource? And obviously Cyprus is this really peaceful, comfortable, you know, um, cocktail sipping type of place, but there's other places that are not in this area. So how can we reflect that in a way that is realistic? So Lebanon, for example, is, is one example. And then there's also Yemen, you know? So you talk to Yemeni diaspora because it's very difficult to talk to Yemeni artists and they're like, you have no idea. And it's true, we have no idea. So how, how is it that we can best represent through this, this participatory action research process, how can we best represent this variety of, of experiences here in Cyprus that we're inconvenienced and then Lebanon where you're seriously challenged and then Yemen where you're like, Pff. Um, and then there, the second stage will be content development for the, for the resource, resource guide, which we'll kind of collectively will co-author. And then there will be dissemination. And this is, again, where potentially um, if we can disseminate the information to you and your networks, to, your, to artists that you're associated with, um, to your students, that would be absolutely brilliant because the point of this is that it reaches as many artists as possible. Um, and it becomes meaningful for, for um, as many processes that need this type of nurturing as possible. So that's it. Thank you so much for listening.